All right. So um, you're going to see the screens are going to be black for a few minutes because there's a bunch of stuff I have to talk about that um, although it's connected with the message, it's not um, kind of part of it, but it is kind of part of it. Uh, I want to start by talking about um, the election because there's things happening with this that are of concern to me and uh, because people ask me, this is an opportunity for me to make some very brief statements on it. Uh, I, I don't care what political party you're a part of or what platform that you're a part of. Uh, that, that doesn't concern me at all. Um, but I think if anybody is being um, intellectually honest, there would at least be, at least be, some troubling things that are happening surrounding this election. Uh, when you've got closed doors and private counting of votes, when you have thousands of thousands of votes because of a computer glitch, they go to another candidate, um, you've got a serious problem that at least warrants looking at. And again, I wouldn't care if it was happening one way or the other uh, because this, the vote in the United States of America is a sacred thing and it needs to be handled uh, sacredly. Uh, these, things are, these things are at least worth looking into. Uh, I'm concerned with policies and consequences um, of things that are being said and done. And so uh, if anybody's wondering um, you know, where I'm at on this, that is where I am at uh, in, in a brief way. If anybody thinks that I'm gonna get up here and yell and slam my fist and call, people's, call people names, you don't know me at all. Uh, there's nothing godly about that. There's nothing kingdom about that. There's all kinds of flesh and carnality and, and party priority in that type of behavior. And so uh, we still need to have America get actually convinced that if this thing's gonna turn around, it's gonna be because the people of God are praying, fasting, and crying out to God. I am concerned about uh, responses that I'm seeing from Christians on both sides of the aisle. Um, it seems to have exposed again our commitment, although we say it isn't there, our commitment that a party or a platform is actually going to be the nation's salvation when in fact it is not. Jesus will be our salvation, period. It doesn't mean... It doesn't mean that we can't support a party or a platform or that those things aren't important. I don't want you to hear me say that, but I do want you to hear me say, at the end of the day, this is about King Jesus and no one else, period, <laughs> period. If you have a position that you want to defend, um, I think that's fantastic. We live in a democratic republic and that affords us that ability to defend our position. I would just encourage you to defend your position with facts and not hearsay or feelings because there's an absence of fact going on. There's too much hearsay and rumor and there's way too much feeling. And so let's get back to the facts. Um, facts are the facts. Uh, if you want to defend your opinion, I think that's great. Just make sure you don't lose your Christian virtue in the process because there's nothing godly or kingdom about that uh, as well, okay? So uh, we'll see how this thing ends, but let's make sure that the church doesn't lose its testimony uh, if that's not too late already, all right? Um, let's, um, let's make sure, too, in the, in the process of this, and this is where this is part of the message today, that we, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, do not lose our vision for what our mission is. Don't spend so much time and attention on the temporary things of man, as important as they can be, don't let so much energy and time be poured into those things that you're actually losing sight of what we're actually here for that has eternal consequences. And so I share that from um, love and experience for the last 30 years of watching the ups and downs and the ebb, ebbs and flows of the various 
uh, presidencies and Supreme Court justices and all the stuff that's gone on for 30 years. I've, I've watched it, I've paid attention to it, I have devoted a significant amount of my personal time to praying for every single president for the last 30 years, regardless, in obedience to Second Tim- or First Timothy chapter two, verses one through five. I don't care who's in the White House, I know who sits on the throne, and he's told me to pray for every single president that we have. So, uh, there you go, let's not lose vision for our mission. All right, now let me switch gears and get into um, trying to describe and paint a picture for where I've been, uh, where I returned from late uh, last Saturday night. I was on a Jesus adventure, and um, there's, there's pastors in America that are involved in in wonderful projects where they get to stand up in front of their people in advance and say, hey, I'm going to do this this week, would you pray for me? And that's fantastic, I'm I'm gonna make an appeal to you uh, to do that for the week I've got coming up. It's just the last couple weeks I haven't been able to talk about it uh, publicly, and so now you get to hear about it after the fact, after the fact. So I returned last week from a Jesus adventure that included several really interesting things. It included a specially approved midnight crossing of the Tigris River at the closed border between Iraq and Syria as I headed deep into Syria. Uh, We were under the protection of heavily armed anti-terror troops from the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, We were in armored vehicles. We had four days of meetings with the leaders of the AANES, which is the Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria. The AANES is made up of uh, Kurds, Muslim Kurds, Yazidis, and Christians. Not just that interesting mix of people, but also, yes, in the middle of the Middle East, women have equal rule and reign in the AANES. It is is the only place in the Middle East where there is gender equality. It is the only place in the Middle East where there is freedom to worship the God of your choosing, to preach the God of your choosing, and to convert to the God of your choosing while having the free ability to build whatever church, mosque, or synagogue you want. It is the only place in the entire Middle East where this is allowed, and most of us know nothing about it. Pretty interesting place. What I heard, saw, and experienced has impacted me forever. I want you to know the last time that you saw me in this pulpit, you are looking at a different man now. I... I know that you know that I love Israel and it impacts me big time and I tell people it'll change your life and it will and it, it, it does change your life in a way that, that this can't but I'm telling you that what I experienced deep within Syria has forever impacted me in a way that nothing else ever has nor can I imagine ever doing. It was intense, y'all, Intense. The simultaneous heartbreak, courage, and hope that I witnessed there not only overwhelmed me then, it overwhelms me standing before you. I stood in city circles where ISIS had ruled and reigned. I took pictures and shot video there where there were beheadings where ISIS then took the heads and stuck people's heads on tops of fence posts all around the city. I stood in city squares or circles where there were crucifixions of Christians, Yazidis and moderate Muslims. I entered bombed out churches that ISIS had defiled in multiple ways including graffiti. There's nothing funny about this, but I just find it strange 
that I'm standing in the basement of a bombed out church and there's ISIS graffiti written in Arabic on the wall that says, God, I'm thankful and prideful that you made me a Muslim. Strange stuff. I looked into ISIS terror tunnels in the bottom of one of these same churches where arms and ammunition were stored and where the electrocution of Christians happened by attaching electrical power to their earlobes and frying them until they died. Pretty crazy stuff. I heard stories, firsthand stories of kidnapping, rape, persecution, and murder that are forever seared in my memory that Again, simultaneously, you wish you never heard, but you hope you never forget. Figure that one out. I listened as heroic, steely-faced warriors with weary bloodshot eyes, tears running down their cheeks, time after time, meeting after meeting, looking at me as an American and saying these things. Tell us what we did wrong. Why did you abandon us? President Trump's fiercest allies begged him not to leave Syria. Mad Dog Mattis quit over the issue. I looked into the face of a Yazidi man with, again, tears streaming down his face, and he said, I'm from Afrin, through the translator. I'm I'm from Afrin. He said, word came to us. We were warned that the Americans were gonna leave us. They were gonna pull out and that we needed to flee for our lives with our wives and our children and flee to safety. This Yazidi man looked at me and he said, we as a community looked at those people and said, you don't understand. The Americans will never do that to us. And we did. And they were slaughtered. Those that escaped lived to tell about it. I had a Kurdish commander who was involved in a bunch of these battles with ISIS before we pulled out. He said, tell me what happened. He said, I carried American soldiers. We bled together. We're more than friends. We're brothers in arms. He said, tell me what happened. Why did you leave us? We just want to know what we did wrong. It's pretty rough. Pretty rough sitting there as an American 8,000 miles from home in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of machine guns surrounding you. (laughs) Yeah. It's the fun stuff they don't teach you about in Bible school. It's the heartbreaking stuff of the reality of geopolitical politics. So America pulled out last October, and before the ink was dry on the paper, Turkey invaded and has not only slaughtered hundreds of thousands, but has displaced hundreds of thousands of people in northern Syria. They invaded from the north and had their way, and we said nothing because they're our NATO ally and they house our nuclear weapons. There's a lot more to say about that that I'll say at some other time. I'm just telling you these are intense conversations to have. I'm trying to bring, bring you into it and help you understand why you might be looking at a changed person. So 
So let me um, explain some more um, about the situation with the AANES, the Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria. It's a very young and very imperfect and yet remarkable governing authority there in the north and east of Syria. They are made up equally, as I said earlier, made up equally of Muslims, Christians, Yazidis, and women. I sat in meeting after meeting with all of the top leadership of the AANES. Women were chairs and vice chairs of multiple, multiple councils. What's happening there is so revolutionary, I felt like I was sitting there in the middle of the Middle East, in the middle of a war-torn country that was the previous capital of ISIS, and I felt like I was watching the birth of a nation. I felt like I was somehow transported back in time to the hope of the American Revolution with all of its imperfections and yet having so much right that there was something worth fighting for. This type of gender equality and religious freedom is hated by President Erdogan of Turkey. Now, I want you to listen to me and you can, uh, you can mark this down. My watch says it's, it's 1218 on Sunday, November 8th. I want you to mark this down right now. Pastor Steve said, President Erdogan of Turkey is the Hitler of the 21st century. Mark it down. What escapes our news feed over here is beyond concerning. The labeling of terrorist that he puts on other people is in fact because he is a terrorist. And he's proven it time and time and time again even as we speak. Innocent villages that are on the border of Syria and Turkey are receiving mortar fire and little kids are being killed. Thousands upon thousands being displaced. And as he displaces them, do you know who he sends in there? ISIS trained terrorists. But he doesn't call them ISIS trained terrorists. He calls them friendly Syrian occupants. Recently in one of his many rants and speeches, he talked about, quote, the leftovers of the sword. This is a derogatory Arabic statement that goes back to the Ottoman Empire, which he wants to rebirth and be the caliphate over. The leftovers of the sword, those are Christians who weren't killed during the raids that again killed millions of Armenians in the genocide. And he uses the phrase today. Beyond troubling, beloved disconcerting to the max. He is in bed with Iran. He is in bed with Russia when it's convenient. There is a plan to slaughter the oldest Christians in the world from northern Syria and northern Iraq. Anybody who knows anything understands that Iran is fully in charge of Iraq today, fully in charge. Their goal is to make a road from Iran through Iraq, through Syria, and straight into Israel. That's why the Christians have to get out of the way. That's why the Yazidis have to be slaughtered. That's why Erdogan needs to be successful. And so when, I'm just telling you, right? I'm telling you what Trump did wrong. I'm telling you what Biden is about to do wrong. When Biden says, I'm getting ready to go back into the Iranian nuclear deal, this is really bad. When the Iranians celebrate his comments, it might probably not be in our best interest. 
I'm telling you this stuff, friends, be, not to make you feel happy, but to educate you and let you know how to pray. Because there are things that are happening thousands of miles from here that if it isn't dealt with soon by courageous US leadership, it's gonna be too late. And you can mark the date and time down. Pastor Steve said so. I'd love to be wrong. I'll repent publicly. So Turkey has been systematically attacking, murdering, and displacing all these people over the last several years. These facts are undisputed and have been well documented by the UN, by the US Council for International Religious Freedom. Our dear friend Nadine Mayanzu, who I was traveling with, who um, um, does a lot of work there, uh, she's been fantastic. Genocide Watch has, has documented these atrocities. Multiple news, news agencies, in fact, I thought it was interesting that just yesterday, the Jerusalem Post did a piece, you can find it, November 7th, um, concerns over the US role in Syria. And they mentioned my friend and my traveling partner, Nadine Manza from USURF. I'm gonna be in Washington, D.C. the vast majority of the coming week. I would indeed covet your prayers as I share my experience to leaders in hopes of producing policy that align with kingdom principles. Please join me in praying that we could see God do something amazing because it's not too late. Anybody with me this morning? Yeah. So what do, what, do we, what do we do with all of this? What do we do with what's happening at home? And what do we do with what's happening around the world? And, and, and what do we do? I'll tell you what we can't do. What we can't do is lose our vision. And so this morning I wanna share this brief message with you, more of just a reminder. Don't lose vision. Regularly on Saturday mornings I get with a group of six male friends of mine we have a cheeseburger and we solve world problems. We've just been ineffective lately is all. <laughs> I told my friends yesterday morning at lunch, I said, um, friends, I'm happy for you to, to be at church tomorrow, but I'm preaching to myself. You're, you're free to listen to it, but I've got a word for myself this morning. And um, not that that's unusual, I feel like every Sunday I'm preaching to myself, but. Today I'm really preaching to myself. The importance, beloved, of not losing our vision. Jesus told us what we are to be about. That we are to be unmoved and undistracted while being informed and influential in the world's disputes, for sure. But to be unmoved and undistracted with what's going on in the world. We don't need to be consumed, listen to me, with the agenda of the elephant nor the agenda of the donkey, we are called to fulfill the mission of the Lamb of God. And we can't lose sight of that. I'm not saying don't get involved in, in political circles and with politicians. Good night, I'm up over my head in all of that. But I'm there for kingdom purposes so that kingdom principles can be executed. I wanna remind ourselves of what the Lamb's mission is for us this morning and how to go about it. It's gonna be quick and easy, famous last words of a preacher. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Jesus said it like this. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now listen, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Now listen to the response. 
Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you? Remember that, see you, hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink. When did we see you, a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you, sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Listen to their response. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it, to one of the least of these. You did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Friends, the first word I wanna draw to our attention, as if you hadn't guessed it already, is the word see. See. They said repeatedly, The sheep said repeatedly, Lord, when did we see? When did we see you hungry or thirsty, a stranger, naked, sick, or in prison? Lord, when did we see you like that? The issue, beloved, of seeing is really, really important in the life of the believer. What do we see I'm not asking what we look at. I'm asking what we take the time to see. It's interesting to me that the sheep on the right hand of Jesus, (laughs) although they didn't see Jesus in physical form, listen to this, they saw Jesus in the lives of needy people. They saw the Imago Dei, the image of God in people. And because they're a sheep, because they're a follower of Jesus, there was something in them that compelled them to reach out and to meet the need. They didn't see Jesus in his robe and his brown leather sandals and his flowing blonde hair. But what they saw was people made in the image of Jesus that they knew they needed to value and help. And it didn't matter what their religion was, they were worthy of the dignity of being ministered to by the hands and the heart of the people of God. Jesus said, don't lose sight of that. This is what your mission is. The goats, The goats didn't see Jesus or Jesus in people. They didn't see Jesus and they didn't see the need to help people. They claimed just to be clueless, blind, oblivious. Well, Lord, why should we fall into judgment? Like, we didn't know, we didn't see. How can you not see? How can you not see? The only way you can not see is if you're not looking. The only reason you're not gonna look is because we're so secluded and protected in our bubble that we don't see beyond what's happening down the street. We don't pay attention to innocent people being slaughtered even though there are brothers and sisters in northern Syria and Iraq. We don't see that. We We don't see the Yazidi women. Listen, 
72 times in the history of the Yazidi community, they have faced genocide at the hands of their enemies. 72 times. Muslims and, 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 and fanatical Islamists, at, at least there's, I mean, even some kind of respect at certain times, right, for people of the book, the Jews and the Christians. But for the Yazidi who have their own religion, the oldest monotheistic religion in the world, they consider them devil worshipers. So it's nothing for them to kidnap, to buy, sell, trade, and rape women at their own discretion. Women in cages on the street corners, being bought, sold, and trafficked for every sexual whim of every perverted Islamist. Do we see that? Does that that mean anything to us? Does it move us at all? Would it only mean something to us if they were Christian? Well, I can tell you the Syriac, the Assyrian, and the Chaldeans are being slaughtered, and the Christian world's doing nothing about it. We've got to start seeing the way that Jesus saw. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. This will give us some clue. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes... You see, that there's emphasis here. This is different than him being in the city and teaching and preaching and all that. There's something that he saw when he saw the multitudes. He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered. It means that they were harassed and afflicted. By society, yes. By demonic forces, yes. And they were like a sheep having no shepherd. Jonathan, they didn't have the benefit of being in relationship with the shepherd of their soul. And Jesus sees that. And he's not disgusted with them. He's moved with compassion for them. And he wants to reach them and he wants to make a difference in their life. And he wants to better their circumstances. And he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, listen, there will be no shortage of opportunity in this broken, afflicted world throughout all of human history. There will be no shortage. The harvest, the opportunities are plentiful. But where are we lacking? We're lacking in laborers because we don't see the opportunity, and the harvest. Because we're not looking, because we're content. God, I'm gonna get in so much trouble for this next point. Bring it, come on. There is such a danger with prosperity, comfort, and convenience. I don't think we realize it. Every once in a while, you just need someone to come and stir it up like me. I think that's why the Lord sent me here this morning. I, I, don't, I don't begrudge anybody being blessed and prospered and all that. But when it hardens us and dulls us to the point where we no longer see the plight of broken humanity, we've lost vision. Make millions. Go after it. Have, have at it. Do it, man. Give millions. You don't want the stress of making millions and and you wanna do something, just a nine to five job and where you can leave it behind and do all that, great. Then you give what you can. And I'm not talking just money, I'm talking everything else. I'm talking whatever kind of opportunity God puts in front of us where we start to see things and go, I've gotta do something there. May God help us get our sight right. May we start seeing things. May we be moved with compassion. And may we be a laborer who goes out. I love the, just the brief little story in Acts chapter three, verse four. 
Peter and John walking into the temple at the Gate Beautiful, and what's happening? There's a guy outside, he's been lame since birth, and he's begging alms, 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 and it says Peter fixed his eyes on him. He saw him. He saw an opportunity. He understood what was going on. God was up to something that day for that lame man. And Peter fixed his eyes on him and said, silver and gold have I none. But what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And the man jumped to his feet immediately and began to glorify God. And news went throughout all Jerusalem of the miracle that had happened. Come on, what if Peter doesn't see? If he doesn't fix his eyes because he's too busy going to church? Ooh. Come on. I just, I just, just, just little things, man. Just, just little things. I, I, want, I want to just give you a little example. I'm just trying to connect with you all on some way. I'm... I'm my, the last flight, 15 hours from Doha, Qatar to Chicago O'Hare Airport. 15 hours just on one flight. Halfway through, I am so sick after a week of madness. I am so sick. They won't let me off the plane before the Chicago paramedics get on the plane with me and start checking me out. I'm sick. I've already called Sarah and said, book me a hotel room in Chicago. I'm going to die in Chicago. They take me off the plane in a wheelchair, turn me over to one of these guys in the, you know, in the, in the airport, pushing me around. Palestinian kid. Good, come on. I'm praying to die. But I saw. I saw. Here's an opportunity. God has me here with this young man for a reason. He wouldn't just cart me through the airport because I couldn't walk. There was something on it. Long story short, I start ministering to him. We exchange phone numbers and text messages, and I, I'm out of money. I'm broke. I'm broke and dying in Chicago. <laughs> I tell him, dude, I got a Venmo. I got to text you. I'm a I gotta take care of you for taking care of me. I sent to him, he sends me back, he said, it's the single greatest tip I've ever gotten in my entire life, and you were the easiest customer I ever had. He said, let me tell you what one preacher did. He said, I served this guy for three hours, lugged his stuff all around the airport, three hours. He said, he tried to tip me with the Bible. I thought, I'm gonna find that preacher, beat him to death with that Bible, and <laughs> preach his funeral. seen when you do that what 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 is that you're you're gonna impress a palestinian young man with a free bible after he's busted his butt for three hours lugging your stuff around come on we gotta do better than that we gotta be better than that seen it's not enough just to see. Well, let me ask you the question first. Who do we need to start seeing beyond our comfortable bubble? Who do we need to start seeing? Ask God to help you see. Ask God to open your eyes. Max, after seeing, you gotta do. You gotta do. It's not just enough to see. There's gotta be a response and what did they do according to Jesus? They gave food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, shelter to the stranger. They clothed the naked, they visited the sick, and they came to the imprisoned. It's not just enough to see. Jesus calls us to see and do. It doesn't take rocket scientists to figure this out. See what's going on with kingdom eyes and figure out what it is he's calling you to do. I don't know what he's calling you to do. But my guess is, listen, my guess is it's way bigger than anything you could imagine. What, what in the world, what right 
does a dude who's preaching in a little country church in Leapers Fork, Tennessee, why am I with ex-warlords in South Sudan and Kurdish commanders in Syria? It doesn't make sense, but God. Come on. Nothing special about me. But you gotta, you gotta make yourself available, man. There's gotta be a scene and there's gotta be a doing and it warrants the question, who might God touch through us if we increased our seeing and our doing? What if we determined to be laborers who see? What harvest might we reap? The last word, and you're not gonna like this word, is risk. I'm excited about seeing it. Okay, I'm excited about doing. Risk, not so much. Risk. Because doing for the hungry and doing for the thirsty and the homeless and the naked and the sick and the imprisoned, it can be complicated and risky at times. God's not going to call you into things every single time that are just comfortable and wonderful. This is awesome, praise Jesus, I love this. <laughs> Sometimes he's gonna call you into something that makes you a little tight. And what are you gonna do with that? Risky. God, I'm, I'm sorry you have been so good today, but I, can you entertain me for just a second? Man, I'm reading right now the response of the church throughout the last 2,000 years to plagues and epidemics that have happened in church history. And I read it and I weep for the condition of the church today. A 20-year-old Charles Spurgeon Cholera-infected London. 13% of the population being wiped out and a 20-year-old man refusing to shut the church down, refusing to stop ministering to people and doing funerals every day of the week. And he said, I don't care if I get sick. I've got a mission and I see my vision and I'm getting after it. Martin Luther in the Reformation, in his life, three different epidemics swept through his life. Hundreds of thousands of people killed. The bubonic plague, listen y'all, millions of people from the 13, 14, 1500s when the bubonic plague was happening or the Black Death as it was called, millions of people, half of the European Union was demolished with death. Our forefathers, the vast majority of them, didn't run and hide, didn't lock themselves in their houses. They faced the thing head on and said we've got a calling from Jesus himself. Miraculously, can I tell you what happened, friends? Pagans and unbelievers died at exponentially higher rates than followers of Jesus. And while pagans were throwing their half-dead relatives out on the streets, Christians were picking them up and ministering to them. Risk. I understand if you are High, what's it called? Risk. High risk, thank you, what a great word. <laughs> I understand if you're high risk, I understand if you've gotta stay home, no judgment, I promise you, no judgment. But friends, can I say for the first time since this pandemic has started publicly, can I say this publicly? A virus that has 99.5% survivability and it has shut us and our faith down, I think there's a problem here.
Let me, let me show you something here real quick. We're almost done. This is in the city of Tabga, Syria. I'm standing on the roof, and I want you to, to picture a dome over the, the center of the sanctuary, the dome roof, and directly underneath it is the sanctuary. On top of the dome, you see this old rusty cross. After ISIS blew this building to pieces, the community came together after ISIS was defeated. Christians, Yazidis, and Muslims came together in peace and raised the cross over the building. They were saying to the Christians who were there, still in town, that Christianity has not been defeated. And they were saying to Christians who had fled for their life, come home, we're here, we're here. I took a picture of that, was moved by it, I've got all kinds of video footage from inside of it. I was at the airport 24 hours later and my phone went off. It was my friend and she said, Steve, you know the church that we were at yesterday with the cross above it? I said, yeah. She said, Islamic radicals tore the cross down today. ICE has been defeated for three years. The cross has been there for a while, been up for a while. The day after we were there with our convoy of armored vehicles and anti-terrorist soldiers, the day after we were there, they tore it down from the roof. If I was wondering at all if they knew that we were there in their midst, I didn't have to wonder anymore. They were making a statement. You may be here now, but as soon as you leave, we'll destroy this place again. A little risky sometimes. Yesterday's version of American Christianity isn't going to get the job done in the future, folks, I can tell you right now. And we have to start making decisions. Are we going to be people who see, who do, and who risk so that we can reap a harvest that we never even imagined? Or we'll just keep doing what we do, always doing what we've always done, and we'll always get what we've always got. It's going to require something new and different to get a different harvest. I pray for myself. I told you I was preaching to myself today. I pray that we don't get so distracted with the rest of the stuff that's going on with the elephant and the donkey that we forget about the lamb. That's right. Well, let's stand and say a closing prayer, shall we? Yeah. You can. You can pray for me. You can pray for me. Thanks. Jeff, if you could pray and everybody can agree with you, that would be great. Lord, we just thank you so much for everything that you're doing, Lord. We thank you for our pastor, Lord. He's prepared to walk in the path of death, Lord, for you, Lord. I pray night, right now, Lord, that you just bless this man and his family. Beyond measure, Lord, that you put a hedge of protection around him, Lord. And that you guide him step by step where you have him to go, Lord. Bring even more people, more people around that he can minister to, Lord. But make us praying saints for him, Lord. 
Let us lay down our lives for him, Lord, as well. Because we need to pray over him and protect him and his family, Lord. Lord, continue to move. Continue to move in his life. Continue to use him, Lord. Take the pressure off him, Lord. Give him peace, Lord. Give him strength, Lord. Guide him. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we pray. Amen, Lord. Father, for our entire church family, we pray that you would help us to see what we've never seen before, do what we've never done before, and risk more than we ever have before. The day demands it. The day demands it. Have your way, oh God, we pray. We don't just sing it, we pray it. God, have your way. In the name of Jesus, who is worth it all. In Jesus' name. Amen, somebody. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. We'll see y'all Wednesday night. Wednesday night for Before the Throne. Come on out. It's going to be great. Keep me in your prayers this week as I'm in Washington, D.C. Thank you. God bless you guys.